Lovely. So hi, everyone. I'm going to be talking about sepsis today. Um, and this is roughly what we're going to be covering. So we're going to be doing an introduction. We're going to talk about severity and scoring, um, specifically the sepsis six, which is our usual management style. Um, it's just looking at all the different systems, the, um, any nuances of each system and how to manage sepsis based on that. And then an overview with a case. This is me. Um, so I'm Dr. Akash Doshi. I'm an endocrinology and diabetes registrar and also as a medical registrar. Um, you can see my Twitter handle there. So please do um, tweet out to me if you've got any questions, if you've got any um, stories or all those lovely pictures that you're going to be sending to CPD me. So the first part, what is sepsis? Well, the way that sepsis is defined is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. It's a bit of a mouthful. But essentially what we're trying to say is that in sepsis, the body is attacking the bug um, in such a way that it causes this powerful inflammatory response. This powerful inflammatory response causes all the sequelae of sepsis and actually in itself um, it's so dysregulated that it threatens organ function and so when we are wondering how bad sepsis is what we're wondering is how bad each organ is and so in the olden days what we used to use is uh, SIRS um, to look into this so uh, what we would look at were any features that would suggest somebody was septic, such as if they were pyrexial, if they had a low blood pressure, if they had a high heart rate, if the respiratory rate was high, if their um, white cells were, were quite high or their high lactate. And that was an idea of this could be SERS, this could be, this could therefore be infection. And so sepsis was defined as features of SERS this systemic inflammatory response syndrome with a definite source of infection. And septic shock was defined as um, having a low blood pressure and your organs not working. We've kind of gone away from that um, these days um, because ultimately if any person comes in with anything, uh, any type of illness, we should immediately question whether it could be sepsis. But we've gone to these um, scores called SOFA and QSOFA to kind of help us identify uh, and assess the severity of infections in, in, in patients. I put the old, uh, the old definition in there though, because anybody who comes in um, with any derangement obs observations, a high lactate or looks unwell, you should think sepsis may be the cause of this. So uh, sepsis, uh, sorry, um, SOFA score is called the Sequential Organ Failure Assessment Score. It's kind of a novel score that we use to identify whether somebody's got bad or good sepsis, i.e. is it so severe that it's going to be life-threatening or is it okay and they're much less likely to die from it. The full score, the true SOFA score uses all of these parameters and it's very complex. And so it's not actually the score that we use in day-to-day -day practice. But I think it's helpful to go through the components because you get, an, uh, get a flavor of how sepsis affects our bodies. So there's PAO2, FiO2 ratio. What, what that's basically saying is how much oxygen are we going in and how much oxygen are we getting in when we measure our oxygen levels in our bloodstream. And so if you're particularly septic and your lungs are full of gunk and water and edematous, you don't get much uh, oxygen in, and particularly if you've got a pneumonia. And so having to use lots of oxygen to keep your oxygen levels up suggests you've got bad sepsis. In the same way, um, if your platelets, your, um, you're using up all your platelets because you're getting random clots and random amounts of inflammation, that's also a bad sign as well as uh, bilirubin, if, you, if, your livers are not, if your liver isn't working, or your blood pressure, or your brain, or your kidneys. Um, so essentially what we're looking at is each organ, main organ in your body and seeing whether it's working or not. The quick safer score is one that you and I are all gonna be much, much, find much easier to use. This looks at three things. One, the brain, two, the lungs, three, the heart. And so that is so much more simple because it allows us to quickly grade whether 
somebody is life-threateningly bad that we need to bring them into hospital definitely that we also need to make sure that we get them, give them urgent 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 treatment these are the people who you're going to be seeing um, in a primary care setting in a first responder setting and thinking oh dear i'm gonna have to get these patients into hospital super super quick and if i see them in hospital where i work if I see somebody with any of these parameters, I'm going to think, oh no, this patient needs my prioritized care. So that's when they've got to, basically when they're anything less than a GCS of 15, I mean, when they're not alert, when they're a little confused, when they've got high respiratory rate. So respiratory rate is your most sensitive marker for any signs of illness, including sepsis, and if their blood pressure is low. And this is actually quite simple because essentially that's what we're doing all the time, aren't we? We're looking at the patient's observations and we're thinking, oh, are you hypotensive? Well, that's a bad sign. Are you tacking it? Oh, that's a bad sign. You're confused, that's even a worse sign. And so this actually makes quite a lot of intuitive sense. And so it makes it a lot more easier for us to remember and retain the score. And we know that if the patient has got two or three of these things, that is bad. If they've got one of these things, they're probably going to be safe but we should make sure they're assessed um, in, due, in due course. But if they've got two or three of these things, they need treatment within the hour. There are a couple of other red flags. So whether you are in, again, primary care, secondary care, or uh, whether you're a first responder, you just need to think about these things because if any of these things are there, this person is likely to do a lot worse from sepsis, i.e. these are red flags. If for whatever reason they are, their immune system isn't expected to work as effectively as one would expect it to work. So that could be because they're old, diabetic, or it could be because they've got medications or drugs which are causing the immunocompromised state, or anything else which dampens down your immune system. The other thing is if they're frail. So if essentially when somebody's got sepsis, What's happening is every single organ is working at its max capacity. But when patients are frail, what we're trying to say is that they're not able to cope and do the things that they normally would be able to do. And the reason for that is because whilst they can manage to walk around, they can't manage to run around. It's difficult for them to go upstairs. And that's because each of their organs is already working at max capacity. Because each of their organs is already working at max capacity, they don't have that reserve. They don't have that ability to mount an amazing response to infection and to other stresses. And that's why patients with frailty are, tend to fare much worse with uh, things like sepsis. The last thing to think about is, could they have some sort of invasive or artificial device which could be the source of their sepsis? Because unlike parts of your body where our immune systems can get there and fix things, if you've got an artificial device or an artificial kind of joint or whatever, your immune system can't get there. And that means it cannot actually clear the infection. So at some point, your body is just going to get exhausted. It's going to try and try and try and it's going to get exhausted. And when it gets exhausted, that's when that sepsis is going to go all out and essentially cause a septic shower or septic shock or kill someone. When we think about the management of sepsis, we think about the sepsis six. And so these are the sepsis six. Um, some people like to think of it as three in and three out. Um, so the three in uh, are oxygen um, if required. So we're aiming for 94 to 98% saturations, unless there's a reason to aim for lower targets such as COPD where, where you've got type two respiratory failure, so 88 to 92% targets antibiotics. Um, so it's really important that you get the antibiotics. And if a patient's got septic shock, if they've got, if they're hypotensive from their sepsis and they've got features to suggest they've got organ dysfunction, i.e. their Q sofa is, is raised, every hour in antibiotic delay is going to cause an 8% increase in mortality. And that's phenomenal. The other thing that you need to consider is fluids. So essentially, if they're hypotensive, what's happened are that kind of that body's immune response has caused all of the blood vessels to dilate. It's caused all the blood vessels to relax, which has caused the blood pressure to drop down. That means the heart is struggling. It 
drives goes faster and faster and faster to get the blood around the body, but it can't cope. So one of the things that you can do to help it is basically fill everything up a little bit more. And so it's got more to play with and more to move around. We tend to give 30 mils per kilo or we give boluses of 500 mil until the patient's blood pressure is starting to improve and stay up. We'll also measure the lactate. So these are the three out. The lactate, it, um, so we're really concerned if it's above four. If it's above two, we're like, mm, well, that's a bit worrying. We'll repeat it, we'll give some fluids. But if it's above four, that suggests the patient's in a life-threatening state. And so it should prompt urgent fluid resuscitate, resuscitation. That's the 500 mil bonuses, or you can give also 30 mil per kilo. That's what you're aiming for anyway, 30 mil per kilo. You also need to take some blood cultures. This will help us identify which antibiotics to give. Essentially, we're gonna start with broad spectrum, um, antibiotics and we're going to try and narrow that down to more focused antibiotics because the benefit of that is they will be more effective because they will deal with any resistant patterns that we found from our blood cultures but also they will reduce the risk of resistance. And so it's really important to get some blood cultures off so that we can work out where the bug is coming from, what the bug is um, and also how long the antibiotics need to go on for and whether the bugs are likely to be resistant. And finally, the urine output, because what we want to make sure is there's no evidence of organ dysfunction. So again, we're going to be looking at the brain, we're going to be looking at the lungs, we're going to be looking at the, at the kidneys, because those are the brain, those are the organs that tend to be first affected. And so we will aim to put a catheter in and really measure the fluid balance, uh, assuming that if we aren't getting the right fluid balance, we're going to increase the amount of fluids until we are i.e. that the urine output is good and that the kidneys are recovering. Another thing that people like to use is buffer though, and that's the way of uh, remembering each of these. So B for blood cultures, U for urine output, F for fluids, A for antibiotics, L for uh, lactate and O for oxygen. And so that's another thing that you could remember, the sepsis buffer though. The next thing to consider are each of the organ systems. So each of the organ systems have a couple of nuances that just help. If we do this, then it helps you ask the right questions and think about the right management. So the first is CNS. So our central nervous system infections or our brain, tend, one would tend to say these, we tend to mean brain infections. The one that we worry about is meningitis and encephalitis, but meningitis is the is the kind of focus because it's far more common. What you're looking for are signs of meningism, i.e. inflammation of the meninges, the uh, membrane that surrounds the brain. And what that causes is neck stiffness. So we often ask patients um, to get their chin and bend it down to their chest. And if they can do that, we say that they don't really have neck stiffness. We can also look for photophobia. When, what we're not saying is, oh, they, they prefer it in the dark. We're saying they, the light is shining and they are covering themselves. It's painful, it's horrible. That's what we really mean when we say photophobia. We're also looking for reduced GCS and seizures. Seizures would be in keeping with meningitis, but it's also very characteristic of encephalitis. Any patient who comes in with a seizure, I will automatically consider infection until proven otherwise. It's very rare that it's the cause, but it's very dangerous for me to miss. And so that's one thing that you really should consider. The next thing is oral ENT infections. It's quite rare that patients come in floridly septic from uh, oral and ENT infections. I think the thing that you need to think about though is whether it impacts their swallow or their breathing, and that would be something that would make us um, think twice about a patient um, in addition to the QSOFA score. Cardiovascular uh, causes of sepsis are vanishingly rare, and so we won't really focus on those. Respiratory, now this is incredibly common. And so the thing that we need to think about here is pneumonia. And you can see a chest x-ray here showing focal consolidation in the uh, right middle lobe. Um, but Essentially, what we need to think about is, is there any aspects of this infection that's going to make us just worry a touch more? 
in the day and age of COVID, unfortunately, that'll be one of the things that we'll have to consider. But in addition to that, um, is, that is it somebody who's from a nursing home or from a care home or somebody who's been in, recently in hospital? So could this be a hospital acquired pneumonia? The reason that's an issue is because those bugs tend to be far more resistant than the ones that you get from a hospital or a nursing home. Could this be an aspiration pneumonia? So essentially that's where our swallow isn't particularly safe and the bugs go in down the wrong way into our lungs. And that can be dangerous. So it's important to ask if there's any problems with swallow or if there's any problem or if there's been a local hospital admission, because this is going to change our management. It's going to change the antibiotics we use to cover for more broad spectrum things that we otherwise wouldn't have covered. We're going to think about the CURB 65 score. So this looks at confusion, urea, respiratory rate, blood pressure, essentially, and the age of more or less than 65. But in the true sense, what we're going to do is Google CURB 65 every time we see a pneumonia and just put down what the patient's parameters in front of you are. We don't need to remember this score anymore. And finally, we need to ask about travel. The CURB 65 score, the reason it's useful is because it can help us identify who is likely to have to stay in hospital and who's, who's going to be able to go home. So if you do have a patient who's above 65 and a patient who's got that blood pressure or they're confused, you know they're automatically going to need to come in. Urea is a bit more difficult to be able to tell in primary care, but it's basically impossible to tell in a primary care or first responder setting. But the question that you can ask as a substitute for urea, are they producing urine? Because if they're not producing urine or they're producing minimal amounts, then you know that they've started to develop acute kidney injury, i.e. that their urea is going to be high. And then the four other body systems. So underneath the diaphragms. Abdominal. So the thing that's going to make us really worry about abdominal infections are if they've got guarding or rebound tenderness. Guarding and rebound tenderness is a difficult thing to pick up. So here's a couple of tips to help you pick it up. Asking the patient to cough is a helpful sign because if the patient can cough um, and they can do it without much discomfort, then they really don't have guarding or rebound. The other thing that you can get them to do it, that you can do is essentially press on their tummy, but whilst distracting them. So ask them about their friends, their pets, their families, and distract them and see if they're still guarding, because a lot of people voluntary guard, i.e. that they forcefully um, basically try to protect their body because they're worried about you hurting them, or sometimes worried about you tickling them. And so uh, essentially distracting them is a very helpful way. The last thing to look for is rebound tenderness. And that is very much a feature of peritonism, i.e. that you're worried that there is a spreading life-threatening abdominal infection. And so what we'll do there is we will press down on the tummy, we'll have a chat with them and then we'll suddenly let go. And either they'll be fine and won't do much and they'll actually be relieved because they're in less pain, or they will flinch. And if they flinch, that's a worrying sign. Next is urinary tract, and this is another very common um, source of infection, perhaps just as common or maybe a little bit more common than uh, chest infections in a kind of secondary care setting. You're looking for dysuria and frequency. The other thing that you're looking for is hematuria. Hematuria is a little bit more concerning because you shouldn't get proper visible hematuria from a barn door urinary tract infection. You can get non-visible, i.e. you pick it up on urine dip, Visible hematuria, you almost automatically wonder, could there be a stone there, a kidney stone? And if there is a stone, could there be an infection around the stone acting almost as a foreign body? That's much more difficult to treat. And so that's something that you need to consider. A urine dip is unreliable in the elderly. The reason being is that about from the age of about 80, 80% um, of them have asymptomatic but it's probably less than 80, it's probably more 50, 60%, have asymptomatic bacteria, which means they have bugs, they, they, they have nitrites, which are positive in their urine, 
but those bugs aren't pathological in a sense that they're not causing them to have an infection. So with the elderly, we rely on symptoms of frequency and dysuria, i.e. painful urination and suprapubic tenderness to help us, to guide us to who might have a urinary tract infection, or we treat empirically. You should not rely on a urine dip because urine dips will distract you from what is probably the cause of the sepsis, given they're so likely to be positive when they don't have urosepsis. The thing that isn't diagnostic is strong smelling urine. Um, it's quite common that uh, you'll get referrals in um, from many, many settings, which say, um, oh, the urine is very strong smelling. I'm worried about a urine infection. And that's uh, potentially a unsafe thing to do. Because again, it really narrows your mind into thinking, yes, this is a urinary tract infection. Yes, I've identified the source of sepsis. And that's very dangerous because whilst the sepsis six is the first initial management, that's only the first hour of management or the first six hours, I guess. After those six hours, you need to find that source and you need to deal with that source because otherwise you're gonna be running into significant issues. The last two to think about are skin and soft tissue. And so it's very easy to miss this. People will ask about a cough, um, ask about shortness of breath. People ask about burning, stinging urine and whether they, people got tummy pain. But what they won't do is ask about a rash and inspect the skin itself, undressing every part which has got ulcers to have a look and see whether there could be an infection which we're missing. And then finally, artificial devices. If the patient has got any replacements, any artificial things, each in turn should be checked. The skin around it, the line itself, is there anything that suggests that their patient has infection? And so that's an overview. That's the theory part. What we're going to do now is apply it to the practical part to our lovely patient called Susan. So Susan's a 72 year old. She's so, so lovely. Look at her with that cup of tea, ready to offer it to anyone who comes and visits. You're asked to see Susan and she's pyrexial and she's shivering. She's got a background of dementia. So already we're worried about her because dementia in itself is going to make this make Susan a little bit more frail. And so she's going to have a much worse chance of fighting this infection. If she had type 2 diabetes on top of that or another um, or a condition with kind of end stage like or a chronic kidney disease or heart failure, that'd be even more worrying. The first thing that we're going to do is an A, B, C, D, E. So that's looking at her airways, her breathing, her circulation, her disability and everything else. And the idea being is that we want to achieve hemodynamic stability. And we want to make sure that she is safe. And we'll use the Q sofa to guide us in terms of how bad this is and how much of her is affected and what her likely mortality is. If it looks like she doesn't have an ATE problem and her q sofa isn't too bad, then we're reassured that she's probably in a safe state. And we can think about whether we need to manage her in hospital, whether we can manage her, her at home. And so we ask the question, does she need to come in? Are there any red flags? So as you remember, the red flags are things like immunocompromise, um, other conditions that would make you more likely to have bad sepsis, that that end organ damage. Well, in this case, she's got dementia. So I'm probably going to uh, suggest that she comes in because she's potentially, depending on how bad her dementia is, much less likely to be able to heal, improve and get over this than a person without dementia. Another reason why is that because she's got dementia, she may be less able to cope at home. And finally, because it's going to be more difficult to identify the source of infection if she's very confused and we can't really take a proper history. It's really important. I can't stress this as far, enough. You need to think about a wide differential. You need to think about all the different causes, all the body systems. So you want to go through top to bottom doing the history, the background the examination. So history. You want to go top to bottom. You want to ask about headache, any neck stiffness, any photophobia. You want to go down to the throat and ask about sore throat, the chest, asking about shortness of breath, cough, the tummy, asking about tummy pain, 
diarrhea, um, and then looking at the skin, um, and then anything else that you can think of like foreign bodies. You want to ask about travel and contact history. In background, you want to know if they've had a previous infection, what antibiotics they required for it. Did they require antibiotics in hospital? Because that suggests either the resistant pattern needed that, or the patient was severe enough that they needed that, suggesting that this might happen again. Foreign bodies, as I said, and those red flags once again. And then the examination. The examination needs to be, again, top to toe. You're going to go through every single part of them um, and look at where that infection might be coming from, from examining their head and their neck stiffness, to looking down their throat, to listening to their chest, to pressing on their tummy. It can be very quick to do it, but it's very important that you do it. And you need to examine the skin thoroughly. You must make sure you take off all dressings and off all things because there could be a horrible infection underlying all of that. And I know many of my friends have been caught out uh, from really bad um, infections underneath dressings. Once you've identified the likely source, this will help you uh, provide your sepsis six. So all of this is happening within the hour. We're going to measure that lactate. We're going to give oxygen to get uh, SATs of 94 to 98. And that lactate, if it's above four, we're going to give plenty of fluids and we're going to monitor their urine output. That plenty of fluids will be about 30 mil per kilo or uh, 500 mil boluses to try and get that blood pressure up. We're going to take off some cultures to see where the infection might be coming from. So that's cultures of everything. If they've got ascites, i.e. fluid around their tummy, we're going to take that off and send it. If, uh, they've, uh, if we're thinking they've got uh, bacteremia, they've got sepsis, we're going to send off blood cultures. We're going to send off urine cultures because the more places that, of things that we send off and culture, the more likelihood of us finding the bug that's causing it. And then we're going to get broad spectrum antibiotics that cover for lots of infections until we're able to get all those tests back. That helps us narrow it down. Here are a couple of further aspects in management, which are a little bit uh, more broad and a little bit more advanced. So fluids, the fluids that we're going to use are crystalloids. We're thinking Hartman's plasma light, 0.9% saline. Of those three, there is not great evidence to suggest that plasma light or Hartman's, your balanced salt solutions are better. There was a little bit of evidence. Um, but it's not conclusive. And so that kind of area is still being looked into further. We'll give plenty of fluids. And if the patient still remains hypotensive, we might think about vasopressors. So these are things which act on the vessels to squeeze them and try and get their blood pressure up. And so that's what we're thinking about. Procalcitonin, I guess, is a much more novel thing that's just about creeping in. So what procalcitonin is, it's um, it's essentially the kind of previous molecule to calcitonin. But what it does is it's much more of a sensitive marker for infection. Yes, it does go up for a couple of other things, but unlike CRP, it doesn't go up for everything. CRP is not very specific for infection. It'll go up in any inflammatory state, gout. Um, it'll go up in um, cancer. But procalcitonin is a little bit more helpful because it will go up in only a few things. And so if the procalcitonin goes up, you can be more convinced it's sepsis. In the future, it will be very helpful to guide us in terms of whom we give antibiotics to and whom we don't. And also just being a little bit more reliable and um, restrictive with our antibiotics, because often um, there are times when we give too many antibiotics. The last thing to think about is palliation. People with sepsis, they get sepsis again and again and again and again and again. If the risk factor for why they're getting sepsis isn't, effect, isn't addressed, and sometimes that risk factor is because they've got a poor swallow, so they keep aspirating, they've got a long-term catheter because they're very frail, there reaches a point where the patient is spending more time in hospital than out, or get more time on antibiotics than not. And if that is happening, there's a, such an increased frequency of episodes, you need to really consider the underlying cause and the reversibility of that underlying cause. And consider whether palliation may be more appropriate. 
because ultimately it's horrible with being somebody who is very frail, who's bed bound, hasn't got much time left. And you spend the last few quality months that you've got, or a few weeks or whatever, going in and out and in and out and in and out of hospital. So if you have got a patient who you know has literally just been in a week or two weeks or only a few, only a month ago, consider whether this is happening to you frequently. The more people that bring up, mm, is this the right thing for the patient? The more we can do the right things for our patients and not keep bringing them to hospital when otherwise that just is really stressful and upsetting and painful for them. So back to Susan Clarence looking as happy as ever. She starts on some IV antibiotics and she shows some improvement. And so she's converted to oral antibiotics and discharged. But once home, unfortunately, she gets worse and she calls the ambulance again. This is unfortunately her third presentation of advanced uh, of aspiration pneumonia because with her dementia, her swallow's not so good. And so advanced care planning decisions and discussions are made where we say, look, this is going to keep happening. Your mum, she's not protecting her airway. She is unable to keep things in the right place. Because of that, whatever we do, we can't treat and prevent the underlying cause of all of this. And so, yes, we could keep giving her antibiotics and yes, she could keep coming to hospital. But what we aren't doing is really treating the underlying cause because we can't and we can't give any long term strategy, which is going to be a benefit for her. And given the amount of pain and discomfort, discomfort it causes her to come into hospital, to have antibiotics, to have all these drips and needles. Maybe it isn't the right thing for her. And what we do is we put her at first and manage her, her at home, giving her the right people and the right environment around her, rather than what's inevitably going to happen if we don't, which is that she'll die in hospital. I'm sorry about that slightly depressing note to the end of that case, but I think it was really important to consider uh, when thinking about sepsis. So here are our three learning points from today. One, comprehensive assessment. We are gonna do a toe, top to toe history and examination, contact history and travel history to work out where this infection is coming from. We're also going to ask about all those red flags which will make us think, ooh, this might be bad. Within an hour, we're gonna think about the sepsis six and make moves starting all of this, particularly antibiotics, knowing that if we delay antibiotics, the mortality goes up quite quickly. Finally, severity and risk. We know that the patients with lots of comorbidities, foreign objects and um, reasons to be immunocompromised are likely to fare much worse in the context of sepsis. So we need to bear that in mind. We need to think about where their seedings of care uh, might be and whether ITU or CPR is appropriate for somebody where you can't reverse the underlying issue. And so whatever the case, CPR might restart the heart, but it won't keep the heart going because we can't treat the underlying issue. And we're going to think about QSOFA scoring just to identify who we are most worried about. 